I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. If you have high quality product to be at the bar, it's like a weapon. It's not about the figures. It's about who those figures are. The Hospopreneurs Podcast. I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack it. With James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 67 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. In just under 20 years, Janine Ellis has turned a single juice bar in Adelaide into an international brand with hundreds of stores, Boost Juice. Her holding company, Retail Zoo, now also houses three other strong brands and demonstrates her abilities as a franchise powerhouse. Janine is recognized for her position on Channel 10's Shark Tank, alongside successful investors like Andrew Banks and Naomi Simpson. But more importantly, she's a role model for Australians, young and old. It's a pleasure to share my interview with Janine Ellis. Hello and welcome to the show, Janine. Thanks for having me. No worries at all. As you know, the first question I like to ask is what's your crazy hospitality story? Look, it's an interesting one. I was a young stewardess on a boat and I had some of the rich and famous on there. And I think one of the things that really stuck with me was that there were some really nice people and not so nice people. And there was a not so nice person on there. I remember giving him two boiled eggs and I put them down. He looked at them, he cracked them open. And then he said, excuse me. And I came back over. I said, yeah, what can I do? He said, there's something wrong with my eggs. I said, oh, okay, well, how can I help you? What was wrong with them? He said, they're too hot. I thought, mate, just sit there for a minute. Don't mm. cool down. So that was probably the most bizarre thing. Wow. Because I thought it was just weird that he would complain that his eggs were too hot. Like it was a boiled egg. They get hot. You boil them. They get hot. And then you sit there and you have a chat and they cool and you eat them. So he was one of those people that just wanted to complain for mm. complain sake. Yeah, right. Obviously, you can't control the temperature of the eggs that they come out. But very interesting. That is an interesting story. On a macro level, I'd really like to know why you do what you do. I think people are wired a certain way. And for me, I love having lots of things on and I love solving problems and I love building things and I love making a difference. So if you sort of throw all those loves into a pot, you get boost juice bars. So I love getting up and having a challenge every day. I love the problem solving that comes with business. It's just how I'm built. Do you think that that's nature or nurture? Did you grow up and you were taught to think like that or is it a factor of both? No, I'm a, I'm a believer that people can change, but I think people are either positively biased or negatively biased when they're born. And the positively biased sees that it's a sunny day. The negative bias will see that there's a cloud coming. So it's how people are built, I think, in some respects. Yeah, it doesn't mean that just because you're built a certain way you can't change. Of course you can, but you have to change yourself. But it's a lot easier if you're born with the DNA of positivity and competitive. I mean, some people just don't care if they win a game. Some people cry if they lose. It means so much to them. And that's not necessarily something that's taught. So you said people can learn it. How do you think people can learn to be positive and should they learn to be positive? Well, the, Are there pros and cons for both? There's always a positive pro to be positive. So, so you're obviously the glass half full yeah, of well, those two. Absolutely. Because, you know, but it's in everything. I can meet you and see all the positive out of you or I can pick it apart as you could pick me apart, right? So, you yeah, know, when someone does something, can you can see it in a negative way or a positive way. I'd much rather live my life in a positive frame and seeing the positive in people than the other way around. You're known as someone who has been incredibly successful with franchising. That's something that I'd like to open up just a little bit. Did you learn from someone specifically or did you just sort of find your own way through the franchising world? No, it's common sense. Franchising is a successful model if everyone wins. If one person's winning and one person's losing, then it's not a successful model. And so for me, it was important that my franchisees, I did everything I could for them to work. Now, do they all work? Of course they don't. It's called business, right? But majority of them do. And the majority of them, if they follow the systems, they do very well. And if they don't, then it doesn't always work for them. So franchising is a really interesting one. But if you go in with the theory that it has to be a win-win for both parties, then franchising will work for you. So you think that that's specific to franchising? No, if I'm doing a negotiation with anyone and I talk to people in my business is you have to sit yourself in both seats to get the best outcome. If you sit there and you're doing a proposal to someone and it's all about what's in it for you and you haven't even considered what's in it for them, well, they're going to sit there and go, well, thank you for that. I know how it benefits you, but why does it benefit me? So the best negotiation is you swapping seats all the time. Find out what they need and find out what their hotspots are and then you can work around those. How do you come up with alternatives that are maybe outside of the option that people have been dealing with in a negotiation? Well, I'm certainly no Einstein, but I certainly think that if you stay at problems longer, you'll find a solution. And Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes the most logical answer is the right one, but if it's not, you just stay at the problem until you find an answer. The hospitality industry is valuable in so many ways. 
something that, that I've noticed is because of the volume of people that we pump through consistently, it just sheds this interesting light on humanity. I'd like to know if there's anything that you've observed about the human condition that confuses you. Nothing confuses me. I think the reality is you've got to understand that if you have a population of a thousand people, in those population there are saints and sinners. There is people that will steal from you and there's people that will give you the shirt off their back. And there's everyone in between. And so I think that quite often people get really disappointed when people do the wrong thing by them or it doesn't work out as well as they'd like it to. And really the answer is that you actually just need to understand there is different types of people and you need to surround yourself with the right type of people. You can't change who people are. They can only change themselves. So try and surround yourself by the people who are the right people for you. How do you identify who the right people are for you then? Trial and error. At the end of the day, we're never going to get it right all the time. And I'm talking more employees. And it's okay to get it wrong, but it's not okay to put up with it. So my answer is fire fast and high slow. And the thing is, though, people want to do a good job. If people aren't working out well, they know they're not working out well too. So you're not doing anyone any favours by keeping them wrong that they're not performing. What is fast? Firing fast is when you realise they are not the right person, stop trying to justify why they could be and actually move it on and create a space for someone else to come in. So with full-time contracts, for example, is that months, is that weeks, is it? It could be an hour, it could be a day, it could be a month. Cool. You know, it depends on the person. Okay. You know? So I've had someone, I remember really early days where this person I employed, I was literally sitting at my desk and I looked out my window and she was getting in the car and driving away. She went, wow, this isn't a job for me. So she picked it up within four hours, she was out of there. That was odd. Hopefully in the interview process, you can ask the right questions, but sometimes people fudge the truth. Sometimes people People think that they've got capabilities that they haven't. And I think that you need to have a very strong system in place to find out whether they're right or not. But I think before you actually turn around and look at someone and say they're not good enough or they're not the right person, you need to look at yourself first. Have you given them the right resources? Have you given them the right information? Have you done everything in your power to make them successful? And if you can answer that question, yes, then look towards them. But don't look towards those people until you look towards yourself first. How do you go about providing people with that platform and those resources? Are they unique to the individual? Or do you find that most people require the same sorts of resources in order to flourish? No, everyone everyone gets information that they need. Some people are just intuitively quite creative, so they don't probably need to work on that area, but they might need to work on their numbers. Everyone is uniquely different and you need to sort of work with that person or persons with their particular skills. What are the things that you find most people need to learn? There's no such thing as most people need to learn blah everyone is so unique like some people have incredible eq and so they don't need to learn that so everyone has their own journey to do but i think the key thing is the reality is that formal education will get you a job but it's actually self-education that will make you a success and so it's that constant pushing the boundaries to find what resources and what learnings you need for your particular skills Obviously, being on Shark Tank has opened up your profile to a wider audience. And I imagine that a lot of people are pitching you their ideas now. How do you ascertain whether an idea is good or bad really quickly? I think the first and foremost thing is that it's the person. Because with any journey or any business, you actually have to have a lot of grunt and fortitude to be able to push through the barriers and push through the challenges that you have. And so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for someone who doesn't want to go to base camp, but they want to go to the very top. And like climbing Everest, you find that there's things that it just gets too hard and you just want to give up. And I'm looking for the person that goes, it is too hard, I want to give up, but I'm going to keep going. So that's what I look for. How do you test that in someone? You can't, you can't. Time will tell. Sometimes they don't even know themselves. It's like you don't really know in a life and death situation who actually comes to the fore and who are the ones that crumple in a screaming heap. And the ones that you often think have got the fortitude to do it, sometimes don't, and vice versa. For the listeners out there who are also getting pitched ideas regularly. What sort of processes do you think people should put in place or do you put in place yourself to acquire the information like those sorts of things quickly? I think when you're actually looking, doing due diligence and looking at buying a business, what you've got to understand is that you've got to also work out is the numbers are fine and you know understanding their business, their product is important. But the process of the due diligence and how they act 
during that process is just as important as the numbers. So for example, if you say, can I have those numbers by Friday and they're not there till a Monday? Well, you're in your honeymoon period. So if they're not going to give it to you on time at this period, God help you when you actually do your business. So if they make a lot of mistakes during this period now, God help you when you actually get into business with them. And do they tell you the truth? Because obviously no business is sparkly clean. There's all warts and skeletons all over businesses. So if they don't come clean, well, what else are they not telling you? So mm. I find the process of due diligence is as important as the numbers themselves. Do you have any little things that you use to identify the mentality of founders or someone who you'd potentially like to do business with? It's called my gut. There's nothing like actually doing it to prove it. So if someone has been in business five years and you've seen their journey and you know that they've gone pushed through and you go, great. But it's not really a type. Like I've got a business called BeFit Foods for the girl who runs it as Kate. I mean, she's a quietly spoken, just determined young woman. And then there's another guy who is, Actually, he's quite quiet too. So it's not necessarily the ballsy boy or the ballsy girl that you think, oh, wow, they've got the fortitude to get through. It doesn't work like that. I'd like to know what you're learning about or exploring at the moment. Look, I think the, I'm interested in the new technology of where we're heading as a world, really. I'm interested in AI and how that's going to impact what's coming up. There's PwC and Bain Corporate or Consulting have both done in-depth research to say that in 2030, we're going to have up to 44% of jobs going to be taken over by artificial intelligence. What does that mean? There's a lot of things happening. And I think that we're not having the AI conversation enough. I don't think people understand that it's coming. They don't even realise that we're actually dealing with it every single day through marketing and through technology and medicine and AI is incredible there's a double-edged sword and I think we need to be very wary of it don't push it away it needs to be here because there's so much good it can do like in the medical field but just be conscious of what AI will mean to us going forward how do you think regular hospitality or retail interaction is going to look in five to ten years with these sorts of new technologies look I think that people have to always eat and people will always want to go out to eat it's not necessarily about staying at home and I don't think virtual reality will give you the same experience as going to a restaurant right but I do think that the efficiencies and productivity needs to come into place hospitality is really hard to make money in and it's mainly because hospitality is people mm -hmm. and I can't imagine that changing too much because people want to be served by people not by robots but how it will change is it'll probably be more the back end area people still want to be greeted with a smile people still want great amazing tasting food and people want it to be efficient in a pleasant environment mm -hmm. that won't change what what sort of back-end innovations do you think the industry has room for? There is never a time that the industry won't be able to evolve. We've got great programs now that deals with rostering and cost of goods and all the things that you're requiring in this space. But at the end of the day, there'll always be a new program that will actually make it more efficient. But it's probably more in the marketing space as well that it's evolving. As yes. Well. Where are you pushing things or innovating at the moment? With basically keeping your eyes and ears open, you know, obviously efficiencies, back-end efficiencies, making sure that people have got the data and the information to make the best possible decisions. Marketing, really, at the end of the day, there's 90% of people in Australia that has a smartphone. There's 9.3 million of them were sold to Australians last year. So that's where people are. So we need to be more on that space and give them a reason to pick us and choose us like we always do. What have you found is a way to grab that attention? People. Make it relevant, make it easy and give people value. Be really generous. What innovations have you seen in the industry in your time? The main thing that happened is that technology has been around since Boost started and it just sort of kicked in. The difference between what it was like then and what it's like now is they promised the world. They now were able to deliver it before they sort of said, yes, we can do this. Only sometimes. Now what they can do is great. And I think what's happening is this constant open source data that's in the ethos mm -hmm. where people are going, right, I've got that. There's my base. Now I'm adding on to it. So someone else goes, okay, now I'm getting your information and now I'm adding on to that. So that's why even now I was talking to to our digital people and they said oh look we can now internally do AI so because we're able to get these programs and these open sources to then build on it to do things that we need them to do I think it's becoming in some respects easier and in some respects more difficult I think the problem that we've got is white noise there is so much technology out there there is so much innovation out there there's so much change out there people don't know which horse to back all they know is that they need to back a horse or they're going to be left behind and so quite often they're getting on that back Oh, that's not right. I'm getting off that horse and then getting on that horse so until they find that right horse. And at the end of the day, that will make mistakes. So people have to really embrace mistakes. The reality is under 23s are built to do change. They're built that way. Over 23s, not so much. 70% of people want to change. Most of them can't. 
How do you deal with choice? Obviously, there are a lot of options out there in all sorts of things that you do, whether it's opening a new venue or buying a business. How do you handle the process of choosing? End of the day, you do as much research as you possibly can. If you get it wrong, you fail fast. The problem is, is actually when people stick at things too long, that's where things go wrong. How do you tell when it's been too long? Well, you're losing money. If it's been too long is when you're actually asking people to make the change and you're allowing them to make the decision and they're not making that decision and often it's too long. What innovations would you like to see take place? I don't think the reality is we could even say what innovations I'd like to take place. The reality is that things are going to happen around us whether we like it or not. I want AI to be able to cure all the diseases on the planet and it probably will, right? So that's an important piece. So you haven't got health, you know, nothing else matters. So it's probably in that space I'd like to see the most innovation. How do you create a space for other people to be creative? Look, it's pretty easy. It's similar to a question, how do you motivate people? How do you get the right people in the store? You can't teach creativity. You have to hire it. You hire someone creative. You can't teach people to be motivated. You have to hire motivated people. And I think it's making sure you put the right people in the right roles. I mean, right now you're looking at my little tiny Boston Terrier. I've got two Dobermans. No matter how little Bailey sitting on my feet would want to be a scary Doberman, he's never going to be. So don't try and put him in that role. No matter how much my big 70 kilo Doberman wants to sit on my knee and be a lap dog, he never will be, even though he really wants to be. So putting the right people in the right roles is really important. So for people who are earlier on trying to identify their strengths and weaknesses, what's the best way to to go about doing that? Well, you intuitively know what you love. You know, people lean towards what they love to do. I mean, if you genuinely love people, you will source out a job that means you're in front of people. If you don't necessarily like people and you really like the technology side, you might source a job that's into IT. So really what it is, is you find what you love. And if you find what you love, it's never work. How would you describe yourself? In the business sense, I would describe myself as firm but fair, that I have expectations that I want them met. I love surrounding myself with people smarter than myself. I like to learn from other people and I don't care if they're 15 or 50 or 500. I don't really care how old they are because I think you've got to have that curious mind. I think I am curious. I think I'm flawed and I think I'm on a journey to continue to learn. What's the next step for you? I'm still trying to work out what I want to be when I grow up. At the end of the day, I'm halfway through this journey of mine and I've got a curious mind to find out what is next for me. I don't know. At the moment, the business still needs me and I've got other businesses that I'm involved with. I'm a director of some boards. I'm a mother and I'm a wife. So all of those things need attention. What's your biggest challenge right now? I don't know if there's a specific individual challenge I need to overcome. I think my biggest challenge is to just continue to work out what I want my purpose to be. Do you have a purpose for yourself at the moment? I look around society and I see how people are getting bigger and more unhealthy and I just go if I can help people through giving them choice in my business to be able to have more fruit and vegetables in their diet I've done my job but also I'm not someone that sits on their high horse and says you need to only eat organic drink organic (laughs) ginger you know I think it's about taste and enjoyment as well but even our sweetest cookies and cream or you know one of our really sweet indulgent range still has probiotics still Mm. has a banana it's still has fruit and vegetables in it Mm. so yes it's naughty and i wouldn't recommend you have it all the time but it is a treat it's great but also we have choices where they can have purely just fruit and vegetables blended we've got Mm. something called pure eden and it's got everything in it from cucumber to grapes to spinach to spirulina to all of these beautiful fruit and vegetables it's got pineapple it's got all these beautiful fruit and vegetables in it which is just blended and there's not one nutritionist not one food scientist that could say anything but great things about it so we've got choice or you can make your own so if i can in this planet help people to eat closer to the tree than what they're doing and Mm. stop eating processed food then i've done my job what about and something that, that you would have had to do in building boost juice would have been to learn more about how that food actually, once you process that, how, how that's affected by the you other know, factors involved in processing. How have you gone about learning those sorts of things and who have you reached out to to learn that in the process and have you required that sort of knowledge? Yeah, only really require the knowledge. You know, we get products into the store and they go out pretty quick. So it's not like a process that you know, we get fresh fruit and vegetables in. They get pretty much used pretty quick and we get daily or every second daily delivery. So it's not really an issue okay. that we need. But I think going to your question on education 
education, which is I think where you were going with that, is that there is so much miscommunication out there. You talk about this diet and that diet and there's a study here and that person's on a lemon juice and that person's doing over there and that's an Atkins diet. There's so many different people are trying to find the, the silver bullet to lose weight and be healthier. There is no silver bullet. It is a lifestyle choice. It's input output. And so I think that what we're trying to educate is keep it simple, like it's not complicated. If you pick up a pack, don't buy a packet of chips. There is no food in that. Look at the back of the packet. There is words you can't pronounce and numbers. That is not food. Go spend more time at the fresh fruit and vegetables counter than you do in the dry goods. Mm. You know, just try and keep your diet as close to the tree as possible. Does it mean you can treat out? Of course, treat out. You know, enjoy it. But even with that, you can choose healthier options. And the reality is, as parents, is we have an obligation for their health today and their health in the future. And we have to take that seriously. I mean, I went to America and went to Disneyland with my children and I saw people who were clearly obese and their children was clearly obese and they're sitting there having hot chips, potato chips and a litre of Coca-Cola. And I sit there and I go, that's nearly child abuse because what you're doing to your children is you're causing their diseases for now and to the future. Mm. So educate yourself and educate your children. And if you choose to not eat or make those choices well, that's okay, but don't do that to your kids. I'd like to ask, with so many things going on, you obviously have a lot of things that you balance in your life. Even in your answer there around what advice you would have for other people, your answer is very broad. You see yourself as doing lots of things as well. So you're balancing a lot of things, spinning a lot of plates. How do you determine what requires attention? You just know. You just know what's most important. You run your life with a diary. You run your life with priorities. You know what's coming up and you need to do it. You just prioritize. A lot of people struggle with that though. So what do you do to determine what requires that attention immediately? And because sometimes the thing that's screaming doesn't require the attention. Yeah, now. people tend to lean towards things they like to do instead of what they have to do. End of the day in a day, every job has parts of the job that isn't so much fun and some parts of the job that's great fun, right? You know, you just prioritize. You just look at your list and you, you might even put a, I don't need to because I intuitively know what I need to do. But if you're really struggling with that, then put an A or number one of the things that you you have to do in that day and then number two things you'd like to do in that day number three things that can wait you know find your systems i mean we're in an era where you can do bloody any youtube video things that will potentially help you you know mm. and that that will resonate with you you know there's lots of systems out there but there'll be a system that works for you you know some will work for you some won't so just get online you've no one's got an excuse now to get not get the knowledge to help them you've just got to do it mm. don't be lazy i have one last question for you janine who would you like to hear on the show I reckon Roger Gillespie from Bacon's Delight would be an interesting talk for you. He's very experienced, has got some fantastic stories, and he's blunt and interesting. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been amazing having you on the show. No, my pleasure. The show today was produced by the in-house audio team at Hospopreneurs, led by Jake Olver. Voiceovers were by Angus Brennan. To learn more, head to hospopreneurs.com.